Hello and welcome. My name is Raj Pasoor. I'm a consultant psychiatrist based in private practice in Harley Street, London, and I'm delighted to be joined now by Stephen Reicher. Uh, Stephen is a social psychologist based at the School of Psychology and Neuroscience at the University of St Andrews, and he's published widely in many different um, branches of social psychology that are relevant to the current COVID pandemic we're involved in. And we're going to pick on one aspect of, of, of many of the things he's written about, which is the notion of authority and the notion of getting compliance from people to own obey or conform to some quite difficult instructions. So, for example, the public is being asked to obey social distancing rules, not to go out. They're having to endure economic hardship. And this notion of the relationship between leaders trying to get people to do something uh, to the benefit of society is one of the interests uh, that's at the heart of Stephen's work. And we're talking about one specific paper. He's written many but um, and, and co-authored many. This particular paper is published in the Annual Review of Law and Social Science. It's called 50 Years of Obedience to Authority from Blind Conformity to Engaged Fellowship. And um, this is a, a, a paper that looks at the famous Stanley Milgram obedience to authority experiments. So, Stephen, welcome. Before we get into the actual experiments, um, do you agree that we're, we're slap bang in the middle of some central pieces of social psychology in terms of the relationship between leaders and the public at the moment? I think the whole issue of how we respond to the pandemic uh, is replete with um, psychological issues. Um, one of the most profound issues is your sense of human psychology, whether people are fragile, not able to look after themselves, liable to crack in a crisis, and therefore needing to be parented, if you like, uh, by government telling them what to do, uh, forcing them to do what's good for themselves, or whether you have a view of uh, human psychology as more resilient, as people able to cope, uh, especially in a crisis when they come together, and therefore rather than trying to order them to do things, we should try and help them, facilitate them. The role of government is to, if you like, scaffold people's self-help and self-organisation rather than to try to organise things for people when they can't organise themselves. So at one level, it's many things, and many of those things are far more important, but one of the things that this pandemic is, is a massive experiment on the nature of human behaviour. So what you're saying, as I understand it, is implicit in the instructions we're receiving in the newspaper adverts on TV when the prime minister addresses uh, the public on television or the experts that flank him do so. Implicit in that, it's not often made explicit, is a model they have of what we are like as human beings and why we do stuff. I think, there's an, about that? That. I think there's an element of that. You see, I think there are different views which are competing. Uh, one view is this fragility view. It is this view that human beings can't do what's good for them. And this was expressed early on, for instance, when people talked about the fact that we can't bring in the measures necessary, we can't bring in social distancing because people won't be able to cope with them, they will show fatigue, um, they will have all sorts of problems. At the moment, we see it in different um, uh, responses to the lockdown. Um, when people uh, uh, go out, um, should the police be going up to them? Should the police be uh, acting in a punitive way? Or should we be asking much more, what is it that is forcing people to go out? Um, and how can we deal with that to make it easier for people to stay at home? So I think these two different views are jostling together at the moment. I think it's probably true that the more paternalistic view uh, has got the upper hand to some extent, but alternative voices are speaking up loud and strong. But what's of concern is if you're right um, in your thesis that the paternalistic view may be misplaced in mm. terms of how it was the best way to get people to do something, um, that, that this model might lead to a breakdown um, in that people will start to disobey, if I can use that word. So there's a, there's, a, there's, a, there's a very high stake situation, which is how do we get people to do what's the right thing to do? And if they, we use the wrong model, the, then uh, it, it won't work and we'll get disarray in terms of um, public obedience. Yeah, I mean, there's uh, there's a long literature, the so-called procedural justice uh, literature, which asks why do people obey the law? Um, very famous old book with that title by a man called Tom Tyler uh, about 20 years ago. Um, and what Tom looks at is precisely this question. And that the, the two approaches on the whole are either you get people to obey the law through ramping up punitiveness or you get people to obey the law 
um, by making the laws legitimate and by respecting people and, again, giving them the means of supporting the law. And what the literature shows overwhelmingly is punitiveness on the whole is ineffective. And one of the reasons why it's ineffective is it breaks the link between the community and the lawmakers and the authorities. It says to them, not we are in this together and we want a decent society. It says, we don't trust you. And because we don't trust you, we're going to clamp down upon you. And so time and again, you find when people look at these types of issues, that the critical thing in terms of getting people to uh, obey authority is to think that authority is acting for them, is on their side, that laws are for our own good. And that when people, uh, public and authorities see themselves as part of a common group, a common community, you get compliance. When authority is seen as an outsider imposing upon you, you can't. Now, it's still true to say, of course, that if you put a gun to my head and you say to me, walk left, I'm going to walk left. The problem is, what happens when you take that gun away? Uh, am I going to continue walking left, or am I going to stay still or perhaps walk right? And that's the problem. Punitiveness only works if you can clamp down completely, have a completely authoritarian situation where we see everything that people are doing. But thank God we don't live in that society. A lot of the time, when we make decisions about compliance, nobody is standing there with a big stick or a gun to our head. We have to want to comply in the first place. Place. And as I say, the problem with punitiveness is it undermines that link between public and authority and the willingness to comply. It makes us feel we're not all in this together, but you're against us. And I, I believe that you feel that we could be at this moment in time in terms of where we are as we record this in, in, in the pandemic, that on the cusp of a key turning point about whether the authorities are going to become more punitive or whether they're going to go down another route. Well, I think, um, as I say, there are uh, different approaches, different views. We see that even, for instance, within the uh, the police force. So uh, as we speak, the day uh, before, uh, uh, five police forces uh, put out, um, I think you could call it an edict, uh, talking about how they were going to clamp down on people who, who violated social distancing. Uh, many others took a very different approach. So, for instance, uh, the Scottish police put out an advert saying they wanted to um, police by consent, that they would start off by encouraging and explaining, and only as a last resort would they resort to uh, punitiveness. I'm not saying one should never punish if people continuously violate. Of course, there comes a point that if people don't listen, one has to do something about it. I'm starting talking about the starting point and the presumption on which we act. And I think we should start on the presumption that people are of goodwill and we want to support them in social distancing. And only if that breaks down, turn to other means of action, not start from the position that people are too, either of too, uh, such ill will or such weak will that they cannot comply and we start by clamping down on them. Is what you're saying even more relevant when we start to talk about requiring people to do extraordinary things or difficult things? So it's all very well having this view that we're going to police by consent. People are going to obey the highway code and, and not speed over 30 miles an hour because that's a relatively easy thing to do. But when we require them to make big sacrifices to stay indoors um, uh, beyond the point at which it's comfortable to do so. Um, when we're asking people to do extraordinary things, when we're pushing them to extremes, is there a sense in which a different social psychology is in play or this social psychology we're discussing is even more relevant? Mm. The, the contrast between the psychology of vulnerability and uh, then paternalistic control and a psychology of resilience and then respect and support is at its clearest in the literature on the psychology of emergencies. Um, the classic view of what happens in emergencies is individual, especially when they get together, um, lose control, lose their ability to reason, uh, that uh, rationality is overwhelmed by emotion, and they panic. This panic view is uh, certainly it's very powerful in the media. You can't get a good Hollywood disaster film without uh, people running from the exits, screaming, waving their hands, and because they're acting irrationally, blocking up the exits and then dying. 
But actually, the more people have researched what actually happens in emergencies and disasters, you find something very different indeed. On the whole, what happens in disasters and emergencies is that people um, support each other, they cooperate, um, they help, even when they're at risk themselves. We found this ourselves when we did research, um, say, around the London bombings in 2005. When the emergency services arrived, they expected to see people panicking out of control. But what they found was that people were helping each other, were supporting each other, even were doing volu- um, rudimentary first aid on each other. In other words, what you found was mutual self-help. And the reason for that, and we've looked into it, myself and my uh, colleague, John Drury, uh, in Sussex, we've looked at this over a number of years. And what tends to happen when you get an emergency, when you get a crisis, is that people form a sense of shared identity, a sense of we, because we're all in this together, we have common fate, shared identity emerges. And shared identity, as another body of research shows, is the basis for cooperation, for respect, for mutual self-help. And therefore, what you see is the emergence of a collective resilience, not a quality which particular individuals have and others don't, but rather something we achieve together through the support of others. And I think we're seeing that very clearly in uh, in this particular pandemic. We're seeing huge outpourings of solidarity, the likes of which we've never seen before. Many people will say, for the first time in many years, I've got to know my neighbours and the people in my street. We have a WhatsApp group. We deliver food to each other. And the point is this. When you have a major emergency, the emergency services are never going to be able to cope on their own. There's simply not enough of them, not enough police officers, not enough uh, care workers and so on. When it comes to all the things we will need to be able to stay indoors through this pandemic, simple things like ordering food, like um, um, like getting medicines and so, so on, we depend on each other. So the group, the collective, is the most precious resource we have. And if we assume that actually the public, especially when they join together in groups, are a problem, then what we do is we spurn that precious resource. So, yes, we have got the psychology uh, of human behavior in general wrong, but particularly in crises, then uh, what we find is that as long as people are able to come together, they are remarkably resilient. And one final point, there is an emerging literature which shows that when people form groups and when, therefore, they assume they will get the support of groups, uh, one finds that in the short term, it lowers stress and increases hoping, uh, coping. And in the longer term, it is good for both mental and physical health. For instance, membership of a group, one group, lowers your chance of being depressed in five years' time by about 20%. When you join three or four groups, it goes up to 40 or 50%. The group is probably the most powerful tool we have for dealing with future mental uh, distress, more powerful than any pill. And therefore, it's something to be nurtured, something to be understood, and something to be treasured. Okay, so um, let's talk about uh, an experiment, uh, perhaps the most famous experiment in social psychology or psychology overall, which um, you have critiqued in this paper we're discussing, 50 Years of Obedience to Authority from Blind Conformity to Engaged Followership. Um, So this is a famous study uh, performed by a Yale psychologist called Stanley uh, Milgram. And the background to the experiment, some people uh, say, is what happened in Nazi Germany in the Nuremberg trials. People said they were just following orders. So there was already a model emerging um, that Milgram's experiments were meant to be partly about, at least, about this notion of why do people do terrible things? Um, So could you say something about that background before we discuss the experiment? Absolutely. And you're absolutely right to say that they are most famous uh, experiments uh, ever done, not only in social psychology, but in psychology. Um, We even have evidence to show that. You ask people what are the most famous studies, and they will always come up with two, one being uh, Milgram's obedience studies. And I should say they are studies, not one study. He did about 30 variants of the study. Uh, And the other is Philip Zimbardo's um, uh, Stanford Prison Experiment. So both are obsessed with this question, what allows people and seemingly ordinary people to do extraordinarily uh, 
uh, well, harmful things. And you're also quite right to say that it comes out of the Holocaust. I mean, uh, Milgram was of a Jewish background. He writes very movingly and very eloquently of how he and his family during the war sat by the radio, wondering what was happening to their relatives in, uh, in Europe. And the way the experiments emerged was out of some earlier research, very famous research uh, by another famous Jewish social psychologist, Solomon Ash. And Solomon Ash was looking at conformity. And he did a set of studies, which at least to us psychologists are famous, less famous outside, um, where what you do is you show people a series of uh, line lengths, and then you show them another line, and you ask them to match the first line to the other lines, which of the lines is the same length. And it's a very simple task. And if you get people to do it on their own, they always say, um, get the right answer. But if they do it in a group um, where everybody else who is a confederate of the experimenter gets it wrong, then on about one of three trials, people themselves give the wrong answer, um, which seems remarkable. It seems that they are allowing the group to distort what's going on in their own eyes uh, and... Um, uh, saying things which are at one level absurd. So this seemed to show the uh, phenomenon of conformity. Ash himself said, look, it shows conformity. It also shows non-conformity. He said, despite everything I threw at them, it was only about one of three trials when people conform. So we should see these as the conformity and non-conformity experiments, not just the conformity experiments. And that's an important point, which I'll come back to in a moment. But uh, Milgram, who was not only a very good scientist, but was actually a very good showman, said, look, this is all very well conceptually, right? The idea that people conform and, and, and say things that deny the evidence of their own eyes is conceptually strong, but the actual illustration isn't that strong. Showing people getting it wrong on line lengths, interesting, hardly makes you fall off your chair. He wanted to ask the question, when do we conform on the things that really matter? And he thought about it, and he thought about it, and then he had this idea that what he would do is use an authority, not a number of other people, but use an authority to tell people to punish somebody else. And how far would they go in conforming to that toxic instruction before they said no? And he called it an incandescent moment when he had that idea, because that began to get close to the phenomena that he was really interested in, which came from his background and came from his youth of how come so many seemingly ordinary Germans were able to impose such harm on other people. Um, the other reason why there is a link between uh, Milgram and the Holocaust is a historical coincidence. At exactly the same time, literally exactly the same time, as um, Milgram was doing his studies in Yale, um, they're called the Yale Obedience Studies, in 1961, Adolf Eichmann was on trial uh, for his part in the Holocaust in Jerusalem. And as we now know, uh, a young German uh, Jewish political philosopher, Hannah Arendt, was in that courtroom. And Arendt, when she saw Eichmann, expected to see a monster. This was a man who was responsible for organizing the transport of Jewish people to their deaths in the Holocaust. He was the, one of the greatest mass murderers in history. He had arranged for the murder of millions of people. And people expected, when Eichmann walked into the uh, courtroom, to see an absolute monster. But what they actually saw was something very different, a rather insignificant man, someone who looked a bit like a bureaucrat, hunched, balding, fastidious. And she watched this and she said, look, in the end, that's the truly terrifying thing. If he was a monster, we could say, oh, well, evil is out there. It's different. If he's like us, it forces us to ask the question, well, could we do it? Is it in all of us? And she came up with this phrase, the banality of evil. And when Milgram, when he'd finished his studies, wrote up his famous book, Obedience to Authority, in 1974. He starts off by citing uh, Arendt and the banality of evil and saying, look, it, it seems that Arendt was closer to the truth than she know, knows. Not only does she have historical evidence, Milgram argued he had now clear scientific experimental evidence to back up that idea. So, as I say... Milgram becomes woven together with Arendt 
and the notion of the banality of evil. And these two strands woven together become so powerful that they dominate thinking for about 40 or 50 years afterwards. If you ask people, we've done this, what lesson do you learn from the Milgram studies? They say it shows that people are programmed to obey orders. They can't help but obey orders. And this idea has been used very powerfully, not only to explain the Holocaust, but to explain virtually every uh, example of toxic behavior um, from um, cigarette, you know, using cigarettes in the cigarette industry um, uh, to the Volkswagen scandal and so on. It is a commonplace that we use time and again. People can't help but obey orders. And as I suspect we'll now discuss, I think that's the wrong conclusion to draw from Milgram's studies. So Hannah Arendt is a is a philosopher. Uh, that's wrong. Um, lays an emphasis on the notion of the bureaucracy in in play as as uh, executing efficiently uh, evil tasks. So um, she also thinks we should be suspicious of bureaucracies because that's where wherein the evil can lie. Um, now, but Milgram is a scientist, not a philosopher, so he needs to empirically validate, he needs to do an experiment to test these ideas. So tell us a bit about uh, this extremely famous experiment. Okay. Well, first of all, let me say a couple of things about Arendt, because I think they're very important. Um, first is the phrase is the banality of evil. Um, the second thing is, actually, I think it's very unfortunate uh, for Arendt, as well as Milgram, that the two have been woven together. Because actually Arendt's thinking is very sophisticated and very complex, uh, and I think it differs in really important ways uh, from Milgram. So much of my critique of Milgram I wouldn't apply to Arendt. Uh, and the phrase banality of evil, sometimes you know, your greatest success is your greatest disaster. And it's a very powerful phrase, but it leads to much misunderstanding. So I just want to say um, that I don't think we should, in fact, lump together Milgram and Arendt. But in popular understanding, they have been lumped together. Second point, then, the experiments. Third, uh, on uh, asking for participants in research on uh, the process of learning. And the idea is that these are the first ever experiments done on the impact of punishment on learning. So the idea is this is an important piece of research and a progressive piece of research. It will help us understand how to help people learn better. So participant comes into the lab and when they get into the lab, there's another person there who they're told is another uh, volunteer and they are randomly divided into the role of teacher and learner. It's always rigged so that the real participant always becomes uh, 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 the teacher and the person who becomes the learner is actually an accomplice of Milgram's. Okay. So then the teacher teaches the learner um, a memory task, it's a set of word pairs where you have to remember uh, which word with goes, goes with another. And after that, the, uh, the, the so-called learner, the accomplice of Milgram, is strapped into electric um, uh, uh, paraphernalia. It's all made to look very sort of impressive and very scientific. And the, uh, uh, the teacher, the real participant, goes next door and begins the testing phase. OK, so they read out the target word and the learner in another room uh, has to respond by which of four options is the right option. Okay. So very simple uh, little learning study. Okay. But. And here's the twist and here's where it becomes interesting. The teacher is told every time the learner makes a mistake, you've got to give them electric shock. And he's given this big electric shock machine to sit in front of, which has got a whole series of switches. Again, it looks like you know, very imposing, very scientific. And what's more, each subsequent error, they've got to increase the electric shock by 15 volts by clicking the next switch, which is 15 volts higher. So you start off and you give 15 volts shock by for the first error, then 30, 45, 60. And the question is, how far will the uh, participant go? How far will the so-called teacher go? Will they stop immediately? Will they go to 100 volts? Will they go to 200 volts, 300 volts? Or all the way to the end to 450 volts, which is marked 
XXX danger. Now, when Milgram asks people in advance, most people say, well, I'd probably go to about, uh, say, 150 volts. Um, and that's probably because at 150 volts on the machine, it's labelled in such a way that it suggests that this is beginning to get fairly painful. So they say, OK, I give an electric shock, but nothing that was very painful or very harmful. When they ask, uh, when Milgram asks how far they think others would go, they think others would go a bit further, but nobody thinks anyone would go further than 330 volts. When Milgram asks the professionals, he asks a group of 30 psychiatrists, how far do you think people will go? Then the psychiatrists think they'll, perhaps about one in a thousand, perhaps um, uh, the rare psychopath might go all the way to 450 volts, but actually, uh, ordinary people wouldn't go further than about 330 volts. So nearly everybody says, look, we'd stop before the end. So then Milgram does his first study. His first study with participants from the community uh, in New Haven, a, a, a cross-section uh, of American men. He does use only men. Um, and what's he find? Well, he actually does lots of variants of this study, but the best known variant, the so-called uh, baseline variant, is one where, as I've described it, um, the uh, learner is in one room, the teacher is in another room, only hearing the learner through an intercom. Um, what he finds is out of 40 people, 26 go all the way. Two out of three, in effect, actually 65% of people are prepared to go to what looks like a lethal level of electric shock because people make errors on a learning experiment. And the pun is repeated, you, repeatedly used, but these are results which shock the world. They seem quite remarkable. And they were quite remarkable to uh, Milgram, which is why over time he does about 30 variants of these studies to worry away at the phenomenon. So a very simple but very powerful demonstration of the capacity of people seemingly to do harm to another person. And these people aren't monsters, they're not psychopaths, they are simply ordinary Americans. And um, of course the question is why? Are they doing this? And, and Milgram comes up with a theory uh, <laughs> under the rubric of, of obedience to authority, which explains why they're doing this extraordinary thing, why they're willing. Uh, ordinary people recruited off the street almost, uh, or very ordinary people uh, are willing, put it put in an experimental situation uh, to basically look like they're willing to kill someone uh, through, through just obeying an instruction uh, from a, an authority figure. Absolutely. The question is why. And as you say, uh, Milgram comes up with his agentic state uh, explanation, um, which he draws from his understanding. I would say his misunderstanding, but his understanding of a rent. Um, for him, the agentic state is very similar uh, to the notion of the banality of evil. And what the agentic state means, in effect, is that in the face of authority, what happens is people uh, forget about other concerns and become dominated by a desire to do well by that authority. So what becomes important to them are motives like uh, pleasing the authority, doing well uh, by the authority, being a good subordinate. And in so doing, they forget the consequences of their action. They don't pay attention to it. So in effect, what's going on is that people are doing great harm in effect through inattention because they don't think about uh, their victim. They don't think about the learner. They're not uh, concentrating on the pain and damage they're doing to the learner. So through inattention and through devoting their attention entirely to doing the bidding of the authority, they are able to produce great harm.
Um, but there's an alternative uh, interpretation which you are bringing to bear in your critique, which is that, in fact, it's not that these people are passive and just blindly obeying the authority figure. Instead, they believe they're taking part in a very important enterprise, which is a scientific enterprise. It's a joint enterprise. They're engaged now where they're connected with the experimenter in an attempt to, to be at the frontiers of knowledge. And because they've engaged in that enterprise, that's why they electrocute people almost to the point of death, or what seems to the point of death? Mm. Well, there are a number of reasons to begin to be suspicious of Milgram's experiments. The first is, as I say, he didn't do one study, he did 30 variants of his study. Um, most people are aware of this so-called baseline uh, study, but are less aware of the other variants. And the interesting thing is, when you look across the other variants, the level of obedience varies from about um, 100% to 0%. And when you look across the piece, on the majority of uh, trials, and the majority of participants disobey, it's something like 58% of people disobey. And like the ASH studies that I described earlier then, to call these the obedient studies is a misnomer. They are the obedience and the disobedient studies. We are so surprised by the obedience, we fixate on that and we forget about the disobedience. But nonetheless, a model which says we automatically and inevitably obey authority has problems given the results show that we only uh, obey authority on a minority of occasions. And what's more, the agentic state explanation cannot explain that variation in Milgram's own studies. It can't explain his own findings and why sometimes he gets very high and sometimes he gets very low obedience. So the first point is the explanation can't really explain his own results. The second problem is actually the evidence does not suggest that people are unaware of what's happening to the uh, to the victim, to the learner. Uh, to understand that, you only have to look at what's called the proxy tape. It's very famous. You can find it uh, online on, 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 on YouTube, which is taken from Milgram's own film, Obedience to Authority, which shows one of the participants going through uh, one of the trials. And he continues to shock but he is agonized. He's he's torn. He's he keeps on turning to Milgram and saying, You sure this okay? Is is this guy okay? It it, it isn't that he is unaware. And if you want quantitative as opposed to qualitative data, what you find is there are particular points where people tend to disobey. And those points uh relate to one aspect of the study that is really important. And that is that Milgram, who was very theatrical. These, these experiments are brilliant pieces of theatre. He scripted responses by the, uh, the, the learner at, at particular levels of electric shock. Okay. So to make it real, when it gets to 150 volts, the, uh, the learner uh, screams out, oh, that really hurts. Let me out of here. I, I, I want to stop and so on. And what you find is the point at which people are most likely to drop out is the point at which the learner screams out. So they're clearly listening to the learner. The notion they're not paying attention simply isn't true. But I think it's the third critique that is most important and most relevant uh, to us today. And that is another aspect of uh, Milgram's crafting of these experiments, is he didn't only script what the learner said, he scripted what the experimenter said. Because again, it's not that people, when they go through these studies, sit there quietly and just click away at the various buttons till they get to 450 volts. They agonize, they try and make sense of what's going on. They ask questions to the experimenter. And Milgram scripted responses for the experimenter, what he called prompts. Um, so the first time people said, should I continue um, uh, the experimental response, uh, please continue. Uh, and then he says uh, the uh, experiment requires that you uh, continue. So a lot of these prompts are requests and justifications. Please do it. It's important for the experiment. There's only one of the four prompts, which is an order. It's the fourth prompt, the so-called famous fourth prompt, where uh, the experiment says you have no alternative, you must continue. That's the one order. And if people were doing this because they were obeying orders, that should be the most effective prompt. 
But actually what you find is that every single time, every time in Milgram's own studies where the fourth prompt was, was used, people say, no, I'm stopping. There's a very famous replication done a number of years ago by an American uh, psychologist, Jerry Berger. And again, he finds every single time the fourth prompt is used, people say, no, I'm off. So the one thing the Milgram studies aren't showing is what everybody thinks they show. People do not obey orders. In fact, when you give an order, people tend to disobey. Now, just to be absolutely sure about this, one of the problems is that the order is the final prompt, the fourth prompt. And you could say, well, it could be by that point, no prompt would have any effect at all. So we did uh, an experiment using a revised paradigm um, that is more ethically acceptable because you could never do what Milgram did today because of ethical questions. So we used a revised paradigm, but then what we did, it was in different conditions. Uh, people were given different, different prompts. And again, the order is the least effective of all. Giving people orders doesn't work. And the question is, why doesn't it work? What's going on here? And that then leads us into our alternative explanation. See, when we look at these studies, what we notice is all the craft, all the things that are going on, which aren't often talked about in the literature or in the popular uh, work on Milgram. And in many ways, we feel that the explanations are deeply unfair to the participants. Because again, as I, as I touched upon earlier, people are brought into these studies with the notion that what they're doing is something progressive, something good. They are helping scientific understanding. They are helping uh, with a study that is going to improve our understanding of learning, which is going to be good for the world. And they part, take part in this study, and they, they discover that this study is asking them to do something actually rather unpleasant. They don't like doing it. You can see that, again, absolutely clearly um, you know, throughout the studies, whether you look um, at uh, their faces while they're doing it on the videos, whether you look at the comments they make in the debriefings. They don't like doing it, but they're still going to do it because they think it's an important thing to do, that they're, in a sense, making their contribution. It's not a nice job, but we're doing it uh, for, for the common good. And then afterwards, we turn around and we say to them, oh, look what you did, you're absolute monsters. Okay, So we, we take things out of context. And our argument is that people obey not because they don't understand what's going on and they don't understand um, uh, that, 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 that the learner is being hurt. They take part because they think they're doing something progressive. They're taking part in a progressive uh, cause. And that's what binds them into the study. Right? They're engaged followers. They, they are part of this scientific enterprise, which is for the public good. And then... As the study goes on, they find a tension building and building and building as the level of shocks goes up. Um, and the tension is between two voices and two moralities. The reason, I think, the most profound reason why the agentic state explanation is inadequate is because it, it, it hides from us what is really interesting about these studies, uh, which is very realistic because it goes on again and again in the world, which is the fact that this situation isn't monovocal. Well, it's not just listening to authority. It's multivocal. You're torn between two voices. One of those voices is the voice of the experimenter. And the experimenter is saying to you, look, take part in these studies. These are important studies. This is important science. If you drop out of these studies, you ruin our science and you undermine our ability to help and understand learning. So that's the one voice. And the other voice is the uh, learner. And the learner is saying, hey, look, you're hurting me. You're keeping me here against uh, my will. You can't do that. Uh, you've got to give me my rights and you, you can't hurt me. I'm an ordinary guy like you. Okay? You're torn between these two voices. And which of these two voices do you listen to? In this multivocal world where people are giving you different notions of what's good and what's bad, and as I say, that's true of virtually every social issue in our world, who do you listen to? And our argument is it is a function of identification. If you identify with the scientific cause, 
if you are bound into that notion of I am part of this scientific enterprise with the experimenter, you're more likely to continue. And if you identify with the victim, then uh, that is you identify uh, with, with the learner, then you are more likely to stop. Okay, so it's a matter of relative identification. Um, and we have done a whole series of studies, and there is a whole uh, body of evidence which I think supports that. So let me go through some of that evidence. First piece of the study we did, it was a very, very simple little study. All we did is we gave people the descriptions of Milgram's various different conditions. As I say, he did uh, something like 25 or 30 studies. It depends on what you call a pilot and what you call a study. But nonetheless, we gave descriptions where there were clear descriptions we gave them. And we asked people to indicate um, how much they think they would identify uh, with the science and the scientist and how much they would identify with the victim. We then correlated that with the actual levels of obedience. And you find that the more you identify with the experimenter, the more you obey. Uh, the more you identify with the victim, the less you obey. And if you look at relative identification, how much you identify with the experimenter over uh, the victim, then that is the best uh, correlation. Uh, so there you begin to get uh, some evidence. Secondly, we've used a number of adapted uh, Milgram paradigms to look at this. Again, as I say, one of the challenges is you can't do exactly the same thing for ethical uh, reasons. We've done the study with slightly different paradigms. We've done the study in virtual reality. We've done the study with uh, professional actors who didn't know what was going on, um, but who uh, were asked to behave as if uh, this was a real situation. And in each situation, what you find clearly in the evidence mounts up is identification with science clearly uh, predicts how much you obey. And that's why we come to this conclusion and we argue that it's not about the agentic state. It's not about uh, not knowing what's going on. Um, it's about believing and identifying with a cause. Um, and, and, and in many ways, it, it's an even more disturbing conclusion because it says to us, why do people do harm to others it's not because they're not aware they're doing harm. It's because they think they are doing right. They are acting in terms of a so-called greater good, a good which justifies doing harm. So in the name of science, I can impose a little bit of harm. And actually, I think that's a fairly powerful message because if you go out into the world more generally, you find time and time again, most of the so-called evil done in the world is done in the name of good. It's done in the name of a greater cause. It's done in the name of creating uh, you know, a new society, a new man, a new morality, or whatever. Um, so this identification with science point is extremely important in the present moment because um, the prime minister is always flanked by scientists, doctors, experts. So there's a sense in which they are trading on an idea in terms of obedience to authority, which is there's an authority figure in terms of the prime minister, there's an authority figure in terms of the scientist. Um, and one of the issues I think your alternative analysis raises is to what extent are there large swathes of the population that identify with the mathematics or the scientific project? Mm. And and if that is the case that um, large numbers of people don't identify with science, mm. um, then uh, maybe this notion that because a scientist says this is what you should do, therefore people will buy into that and therefore do it is a, a, a flawed assumption. Uh, again, what are, you, what are your thoughts about that? Okay. Well, First of all, within our own studies, one of the studies we did um, uh, was to reason that you know, if identification, identification with science uh, is what's important, then if you like, the more prestigious, the more prototypical the science, the harder the science, uh, the more sciencey the science, if you like, the more people should obey. So again, we did a study where we did exactly the same thing. But we either said it came from uh, the Department of Cognitive Neuropsychology or the Department of Social Science. And we know that uh, physical sciences are seen as harder than social sciences. And indeed, what we found was that people uh, were more obedient 
went further and were more punitive when the study was done in the name of the harder science, the uh, the cognitive neuropsychology rather than the social science. So it's perfectly true that we are more likely to go along uh, with the science if we see it as, as, as harder and more prototypical. Um, the second thing to say is I think there are similarities but also differences uh, between this situation and what's going on in terms of advice on, on, on the current pandemic um, because uh, the scientists at least are not necessarily giving us orders. Um, they are explaining to us and giving us advice. But what is true is, and this is just a broader point, is that when you come to communication in general, we are more likely to be influenced by people we perceive as in-group, uh, people who we believe are there to serve our group and do what's in the interest of the group. We are always going to be suspicious of a source we see as out-group because we always wonder about their motivation. Are they giving us advice for our good or for their good? Um, and I don't think um, uh, there's anything new about the fact uh, that we listen to in-group members and we don't listen to out-group members. What has changed over time is who we see as in-group and who we see as out-group. So when it comes to communication about uh, what is the right sort of thing to do in this pandemic, the nature of the source and whether we see them as in-group and trust them is going to be absolutely critical. And clearly that issue of trust uh, is very important in terms of the communication and the use of scientific authorities. Uh, if people, for instance, suspect that they are asked to be locked down and to make sacrifices, not for the good of their community, but for sexual interests, for the economic good of particular sections of the society, then compliance is going to fall. So these processes of identification, I think, are absolutely critical in what's going on. Um, I don't think it's exactly the same as what went in, on in Milgram, so I wouldn't characterise it in terms of obedience processes, but the wider uh, identification processes clearly are in operation. So um, I want to... Um talk a little bit though about the the impact of your thinking in terms of the uh, in terms of the discipline of psychology itself uh, and, and this is the bit where you may run screaming from the room which is that the the power of the milgram experiment is it draws people into psychology people read about it as as doing a levels or, or gcses and they want to come and do psychology partly because of the power of this kind of experiment. And there's a whole raft of these rather theatrical experiments from the 1960s that arrest people and, and draw them in. And then when they come into psychology, they discover the field has moved on and people aren't doing these kinds of theatrical experiments anymore. Um, so the, my first point to you is, is, have we lost something in psychology by not being able to do the kind of theatrical stuff that, that Milgram was doing? And, and does it challenge or go to the very heart of what psychology is because one of the things like him or, or, or don't like him about Milgram was he put people under pressure in, in the laboratory and there's something quite interesting about that and, and ethics committees don't allow us to maybe put people under pressure in quite the same way so so what about that notion the very notion of what an experiment is in psychology anymore has changed from Milgram's time and that the thing that made psychology seem exciting to draw people into the subject was what Milgram was doing but you're not allowed to do that anymore. Any thoughts about that? Um, I'm not going to run screaming from the from the room. In fact, I, <laughs> I completely agree with you. I think uh, there have been a number of analyses in, in, in recent years showing more and more and more that um, experiments uh, tend to be very short. Um, they tend not to involve behaviours. They involve ticking boxes of various sorts and they lack interaction. So we create a model of human psychology while excluding all the things that make um, uh, human psychology important or interesting. And I think that's a really uh, key issue. More and more nowadays, especially because of uh, methodological concerns about the size of samples in experiments, uh, we try and get larger samples by going online. So again, increasingly we get rid of interaction we get rid of uh, you know the actual embodied nature of human behavior and i do think that's a real problem and 
personally, I'm very much in favour of large-scale field experiments um, to complement other methods. I, I, I don't think we should be fetishists who say this is the right way to do it and this isn't the right way to do it. There should be a broad panoply of methods. But actually, uh, more fundamentally, for me, the issue is this. One of the things that all the great field studies do, whether you talk about Milgram, um, whether it's a field study or not, it's a moot point, but certainly it's a very dramatic study, whether we talk about Zimbardo, whether we talk about what I think is the greatest of the lot, but probably the least known, which, known, which is Sharif's Boyce Camp studies, they show that if you put people in an immersive environment over a period of time, you completely transform your behaviour. So in the very famous Sharif Boys Camp studies, for instance, he took boys who he called the cream of the crop. These are well adjusted, nice, uh, you know, uh, boys from uh, middle America. And he puts them into groups and he puts them in competition. And quite quickly, he gets them behaving like delinquents. And we see that delinquency then is an emergent property of changing social relations, not some attribute which marks some people out from others. So one of the really powerful things about these studies is they show us the power of social variability. If you take away our ability to do such dramatic transformations in uh, people's lived experience, then you lose sight of that social variability. And at the same time, we have better and better and better technologies for looking at individual variability. We can now image what's going on in the brain and we skew our subject towards the neural and the biological. Now, I'm not anti-neural, I'm not anti-biological. The whole interesting thing about psychology is we are irreducibly biological beings. I am who I am because of the architecture of my brain but also irreducibly social beings. I am who I am because of where I was brought up and the social relations in which I find myself enmeshed. And it's that balance that is critical. And if we take away our ability, as I say, to look at the social variability, we skew the discipline and we lose the really interesting question, which isn't what is the biological and what is the social, but how do the two articulate? So I'm not anti-Milgram. In fact, I'm a great cheerleader for Milgram. And what's more, I'd say many of the points I've, I've made to you today are points that in private, if you look at Milgram's own notes, he makes himself. If you look at his experimental notebooks, which are in uh, the Milgram archive, which is at Yale University, you find him pondering about issues of identification. You find him talking about how participants came to form a relationship with the experimenter to do science, not to form a relationship with the uh, uh, with the um, uh, learner. And he, and he ponders about the importance of that. It's just that that disappears in the public writings. So when you look at the debates around Milgram, you tend to find three positions. You find one which just reproduces the old story, and I think that's problematic. You find a second which says, oh, let's throw Milgram away. I mean, his, his studies are just unreliable. He hid what he's doing. The, the, uh, the studies are just not worth looking at. And our position is between those two. Because what we do is we, we, we uh, have vast respect. We realize that we are standing on the shoulder of absolute giants. And um, if we can see a tiny bit further, it's because we are high up perched on their shoulders. Um, so we recognize uh, that. We think the phenomena are really interesting. The, 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 the studies are, are brilliant, brilliant bits of theater, brilliant bits of science. But we think the explanation is problematic. And we can actually come to greater understanding by reinterpreting them. So uh, I wouldn't want anything I've said today to be seen as trying to do Milgram down. I have the greatest possible respect for Milgram and for his work. Uh, I just disagree with his conclusions. But that's what you do in science. And that's a sign of scientific respect.
Well, Stephen Reicher, thank you very much indeed. We're running out of time. Um, just to reiterate the title of the paper we've been discussing, it's published in the Annual Review of Law and Social Science. It's entitled 50 Years of Obedience to Authority from Blind Conformity to Engaged Fellowship. Uh, and the authors are Alexander Haslam and Stephen Reicher. And um, Stephen, just to mention that you've also written a book with some co-authors, The New Psychology of Leadership, Identity, Influence and Power, which touches on some of the issues we've been discussing today. Uh, Stephen, thank you very much indeed.